When the new recreational center at the Hadley's Hope Colony opened, nobody bothered with anything as formal or old-fashioned as a ribbon cutting. Al Simpson, the colony's administrator, unlocked the door and swung it open, and the party began. The Finch brothers brought some of their homemade whiskey, Samantha Monet and her sister had decorated the facility, and Bronna Flaherty, the cook, put out a selection of cakes and cookies that she had made for the occasion. The star of the evening, however, was two-and-a-half-week-old Newt Jordan. Al Simpson stood in the corner of the main room and sipped at a mug of hot Irish coffee, watching the rest of the colonists take turns fussing over the baby girl. The Jordan's boy, Tim, had been an infant himself when they first arrived on LV-426, but Newt was a reason for the whole colony to celebrate. The first baby actually born on Acheron. Two and a half weeks prior, on the 15th of March, 2173, Russ Jordan stared at the beads of sweat on his wife's forehead and felt a tightening in his heart. She squeezed his hand so hard he felt the bones grind together, and he could see that she was holding her breath face scrunched into a mask of fury and pain. Breathe, Anne, he pleaded. Come on, honey, breathe. Anne gasped, and her whole body relaxed a moment before she pursed her lips and began to blow out long drafts of air. Why won't she just get here? Anne asked. She's all cozy in there, Russ replied. It's warm, and she can hear your heartbeat. It's a big, scary universe out here. Anne glanced down at her enormous belly, which had shifted dramatically lower in the past few hours. She frowned, her forehead etched with stern lines. Come on out, baby girl. If you're going to be a part of this family, you've got to be courageous and a little bit crazy. Russ laughed softly, but he couldn't give in to the humor of the words the way he normally would have. Anne had been in labor for 17 hours, and for the past three, her cervix had been stuck at 7 centimeters dilated and 60% effaced. Dr. Comiskey had given her drugs to jumpstart the process, with a warning that forcing the uterus into action might amplify the usual pain of labor. Anne gave a deep groan, and her breathing quickened. Russell. She'll be here soon, he vowed. I promise. Silently, he added, Come on, Rebecca, it's time. The nurse came into the room as Anne gritted her teeth and arched her back, her entire body going tense. Russ held his breath along with her. Seeing Anne in pain made him want to scream. He glanced over in panic and frustration. Worried silence fell between Russ and Anne. Exhausted, she used the low ebbs between the agonizing crests of her contractions to breathe and rest and pray that when Dr. Comiskey returned, her cervix would be fully dilated so that she could push the baby out. I don't understand, she whispered tiredly. Tim took four hours from first contraction to last. And my back. God, my back didn't hurt like this. What's wrong? Russ stared at the white smoothness of the monitor stationed above and beside the bed. If the baby went into distress, alarms would go off, but for the moment the monitors blinked green and blue and made no sound but a soft, almost musical hum. Beyond the monitors, quiet and dark, there stood a much larger machine, a huge unit with a mostly transparent hood. If Comiskey had to surgically remove the baby, she would have to move Anne into that unit. It wasn't scarring that frightened Anne, but the idea that she would no longer be treated by human hands. The natal surgery unit would perform the C-section essentially by itself, and the thought terrified both of the Jordans. Humans might make errors, but at least they cared about the outcome. Machines did not understand consequences, or the value of human life. Did we make a mistake? Anne rasped. Russ pressed a cold, damp cloth against her forehead. Timmy was so easy, he said. We couldn't have known it would be like this. Trying to deliver naturally made sense at the time. Not that, his wife said, one hand fluttering weakly upward, moving her fingers as if she could erase his reply. I mean coming to Acheron. To Hadley's hope. Russ frowned. We had no choice. There was no work at home. We were lucky to get the opportunity to work off-planet. You know... I do, she rasped, and then she began to stiffen, hissing breath through her teeth as another contraction came on. But having children... here... The monitors flickered red, just for an instant, as Anne went rigid and roared in pain. That's it, Russ snapped. He jumped from his seat, knocking the chair over behind him, and turned toward the door. 
but Anne would not release her grip on his hand. He turned to plead with her and saw that the monitor lights were all back to green. No alarms had sounded. He didn't care. That one flicker had been enough. Comiskey! As he drew a breath to shout the doctor's name again, Dr. Theodora Comiskey came breezing through the door. Let's see how far we've come, the doctor said, smiling and upbeat as ever. Halfway across the fucking universe, Russ growled. He despised the false cheer so many doctors wore like a mask and wanted to scream the smile off Dr. Comiskey's face, but that wouldn't have done anything to help Anne or the baby. Instead, he could only stand there while the barrel-shaped woman pulled on a pair of medical gloves, perched on a stool, and reached up between Anne's thighs, feeling around as if searching for something she'd lost. I can feel her head, Dr. Comiskey said, concern in her voice. And now I understand the trouble. The baby's presenting in the posterior position. Russ felt his heart clench. What does that mean? Comiskey ignored him, addressing Anne instead. She's facing your abdomen, which means the back of her skull is putting pressure on your sacrum, your tailbone. The good news is that you're fully dilated and effaced. Your baby is about to make her big debut as the adorable princess of Hadley's Hope. Russ hung his head. Thank God. What's... Anne said, sucking in a breath. What's the bad news? The bad news is that it's going to hurt like hell, Comiskey said. Anne shook with relief. I'm ready when you are, Theo. Let's get the little newt out of there. Russ smiled. They'd been calling the baby that for months, imagining her growing from tiny speck to odd little newt to full-fledged fetus. All right then, Dr. Comiskey said. When the next contraction hits, you're going to... But Anne didn't need to be told. She'd already given birth once. The contraction hit her and she shouted again, but this time her roar sounded less like a scream of pain and more like a battle cry. Thirteen minutes later, Dr. Comiskey slipped Rebecca Jordan into her mother's arms. Russ smiled so wide that his face hurt, his chest so full of love he thought it might burst. As Anne kissed the baby girl's forehead, Russ touched her tiny hand and his infant daughter gripped his finger tightly, already strong. Hello, little newt, Anne whispered to the baby and kissed her again. Better be careful or that nickname's gonna stick. Russ laughed, and Anne turned to smile at him. Newt, he thought. You're a lucky little girl. She had been lucky, the first child of Acheron, having witnessed the outbreak on Hadley's Hope and surviving. She survived being abandoned by her savior, Ripley, and being confined to a psychiatric hospital for 13 years. She survived after being reunited with Hicks, together witnessing the outbreak which overtook all of planet Earth. On the dead planet remained few survivors, one of which, another lucky little girl, Amy, in whom Newt recognized much of herself. A lucky little girl, a reason to still fight for Earth, even if it cost Newt her life. Upon Ripley's return from exile came the plan that could turn everything around. The beacon on LV-426 had spoken to her and revealed the power of the Mother Queen Xenomorph, the alien of all aliens, the one who could control the hordes of the parasitic beasts and possibly could be controlled to the advantage of humanity. The mission to the home planet had nearly cost them all their lives, but they had pulled through and captured the beast. They were headed back to Earth on the USCSS Kurtz to make one last attempt to reclaim the planet. Ripley sat leaning against the dock wall next to the containment chamber and listened. Every now and then the queen rustled, a sliding, clicking noise as she moved her sharp body against the smooth, alloyed interior of her prison. Ripley had spent most of the night there. The queen had eventually tired of pounding and screaming in the early hours of the morning. Ripley checked the navigational comp and set McQuaid to work on repairs. The damage to the Kurtz had been minimal. Jones tried to get her to med lab, but she was fine and she had wanted to listen to the Queen beat uselessly against the walls for a while. Ripley was sorry about the deaths of Dunstan and Carvey. They had died to get the Queen to the Kurtz, and she knew that a large part of the responsibility was on her shoulders. But she would have died too, had it been called for, to wipe out the murderous breed, the bitch Queen who had caused the deaths of so many. The fleeting desire she'd had to blow the Queen into a million pieces when she could have was nothing compared to her hatred. The rage was hot and temporary. 
Her hatred was cold and hard and forever. The bastard's extermination would vindicate all she had become. She knew that living a life for revenge was not a healthy way to exist. She didn't care. This was right. She felt it stronger with every passing moment. Each hour was a step closer to fulfillment. Her head still ached where the bitch's tail had slapped her, but it was minor. The huge bruise on her leg already seemed to be fading. She was just tired and hadn't eaten lately. The thought of food and sleep was appealing. She stood and walked away from the door to the chamber. Later, you shit. She called out over her shoulder. Newt sat alone in the med lab at the small computer. The room was cold and gleaming white. It gave her a strange kind of nostalgia for the hospital she had spent most of her life in. Right now, there were more important things on her mind, however. She tapped in a short description of Amy and waited for a match. The screen flickered. A fuzzy picture flashed on screen of a young girl with a bad haircut. She stared at Newt for a few seconds, eyes too serious for a child. How old was she now? Her heart tightened, but at the same time, she felt a huge relief. Is it on? Amy said. Her voice had deepened slightly, and it looked as if she had made an attempt to wipe her face clean. Go ahead, honey, said a voice off screen. Me and Daddy are in a factory that used to make microchips in Northern California. We're probably going to move soon. Her face clouded as she spoke, but her young eyes didn't waver from the camera. She smirked, a surprisingly adult gesture. Uncle Paul says the goddamn religious fucks are as bad as the aliens now. She glanced past the camera sheepishly and then raised her eyebrows, obviously the recipient of a nasty look. Well, he said it. A sigh off screen. I know, honey. Go on. Anyway, we wanted to tell you that the aliens have been acting strange for a few weeks. They have been grouping together and staying quiet for days at a time, and no one knows why. The little girl frowned. I guess that's all, she said. The old man's voice stated the date and coordinates as usual, and the screen blanked. Newt stared into the empty monitor for another moment and then laughed abruptly. She was still alive. The transmission was over a month old, but the family had survived for so long already that she had to be. I would know if she was dead, she thought. I would know. The connection that Newt felt was too intense for it to be otherwise. The coordinates listed were already etched into her mind. It's cold. So cold. We've been on the run for weeks. The Earth we knew is gone. The aliens have taken it as their own. Power to the satellite uplinks went out when the creatures finally severed the main undergrounds. There would be no more transmissions. For some reason, we don't feel the creatures like the others. We've been able to resist her mental lure, while she uses the others to breed her children. The old man, Amy, and Uncle Paul sat by the fire, trying to keep warm, hidden in an abandoned fairgrounds. Paul looked around and sighed. I... I used to come here when I was a kid. There were more sophisticated attractions down by the shore, three-dimensional stuff, infralight, gravity chambers, but I was preoccupied with the machines. I didn't know why back then, but now I think I understand. They never knew pain, the fear of death, and if you never live, you can never die. There's a kind of immortality in that. That's enough, Paul, the old man interrupted. Amy's eyes brightened slightly. You... you used to play here? Show me. Show me what it was like. Pretend for me. She took her Uncle Paul by the hand. That should be easy, he said. We've been pretending for months, pretending there's a chance, pretending there's a reason to go on. They heard a hiss come from the darkness. From behind one of the mechanical attractions, an alien appeared, descending on Amy and Paul. Amy, the old man yelled as he grabbed a torch and faced the creature. Not this time, you son of a bitch. Not yet. He took a swing, hitting the alien across its jaw, knocking it back, much to its and his surprise. Daddy, Amy screamed. Paul, get her away from here. 
Paul grabbed Amy, running out of the abandoned fairgrounds and into the streets, away from the aliens and through the fanatics. The pale, skeletal, wheezing beings who loomed in, dazed, purposeful, looking for human hosts to bring the queen. Come on, Amy. We've got to find cover. We've got to... With inhuman strength, the fanatics grabbed at Paul. He dropped Amy, and the horde moved in, clasping at his mouth as he tried to scream, tried to tell Amy to run as fast as she could. The voices whispered to them, We've been looking for you. She's been waiting for you. The old man caught up, frantically looking for the girl. Amy! Jesus, Amy, where are you? Then he saw in the distance the girl being carried off. No! Oh God, Amy! Our journey back to Earth had an eerie stillness to it. How did the old-time sailors put it? The calm before the storm? Gateway Station was like a jewel, suspended over the blue curve of Earth. Stripped of context, it glittered with rare beauty. We expected to be met as fugitives, but when they found out about our cargo, the plan proceeded as intended. We had stolen the alien's queen mother, and we would use her to gather, then destroy her children on Earth. Ripley spent hours on the security deck, watching her. Just watching. I found my peace in the soulless emptiness of space. Ripley found hers in the pitless confines of the alien queen's pod. Newt approached Ripley, her unbreaking concentration on the monitor viewing the caged mother alien. Ripley, we're almost set to dock. I know, Newt. Come in. I've been studying it, the way it moves, the way it thinks. It knows. It, she, knows everything. I thought that by surrounding her with the hides of her dead, she would withdraw into the sanctity of the pod, but that's not it at all. Christ, Newt, she knows. And she doesn't care. Captain McQuaid called in the group to report news from Gateway Station. We've lost all communications with Earth since we left. Atmospheric static makes transmissions and reception almost impossible. Newt thought of the month-old transmission she had viewed, if it would be the last she'd see of Amy. What? What about the satellite uplinks? The little girl? Hicks was not optimistic. Anyone left on Earth belongs to the alien. That little girl's dead. For her sake, I pray she's dead. Newt's heart sunk. God, no. There's something else, continued McQuaid. We picked it up long after you left. We've been getting bizarre temperature readings from the surviving high-altitude weather markers. The global temperature has dropped an average of 15 to 20 degrees. Hicks leaned closer to the readouts. What the hell are you talking about? Near as we can tell, the methodology mimics our own terraforming technology. We tracked the energy source into space and managed to pull a long-range chrome off one of the surviving spy satellites. It's nothing Terran. We checked. Newt recognized what she was seeing. What had been revealed to her on the site of interest Dr. Arona had initially believed to be the Xenomorph homeworld, where the strange alien pilot had saved her and Hicks and spoke to her, penetrated her mind. My god, it's the other, the one that spoke to me. We brought it here. Its companion died on Acheron, long before the Nostromo, long before any of it. It followed us as we searched for the alien's home, then it returned with us to Earth. We thought it shared our hatred of the alien, but it wanted Earth, not revenge. Ripley had had enough of this. We're wasting time, damn it. It doesn't matter. Nothing matters except those things. McQuaid's demeanor turned grave. Didn't you hear me, Ripley? That creature, whatever the hell it is, is employing terraforming technology. There won't be any Earth left if we don't... You don't get it, do you? Snapped Ripley. This isn't about Earth. This is for me. Once those creatures are dead, I'm through with it. I see. It's easier when you just don't give a shit. The military, the corporation, they brought the alien to Earth for a reason. They tried to buy me the same way. I owe the alien some payback. But I don't owe your Earth a goddamn thing. We're going to finish this. Now. 
So how are we going to unload our cargo without getting eaten by it, said Falk. Or getting our butts kicked by our unhappy children, from McQuaid. Although the questions weren't necessarily directed at her, Ripley felt that they were waiting for her response. I've got a pretty good idea of the layout on where we're headed, she said. We're going to have to do this quick. She'll be calling the creatures to her before we can even land. Newt broke in. She's calling them already, I think. I watched some of the casts that Leslie sent over about six weeks ago. The people on Earth said that the aliens have been gathering together and not attacking as often. The crew watched Ripley, waiting for her to speak. This is going to be tight, she said. The arsenal is set into the other side of a mountain. We drop the queen on the other side and work fast enough to be done before the majority of her brood shows up. They might know about where she's landing, but not exactly. Do you think the bunker will have been raided? Tully asked. Hicks shrugged. Maybe. I'd say definitely, but it's an isolated area. The whole topic had been glossed over as quickly as it had come up. Ripley suddenly realized that she wasn't going to get the response she had expected. We have as much of a plan as we're going to get, she said. Ripley and Hicks led the others to the ship, readying themselves for their final struggle. The flame of hatred burned bright in Ripley's eyes. I'd seen it so many times before. In Hicks, in General Spears, in myself. I watched them disappear into the cold steel of the airlock, disappear into Ripley's obsession, all the time knowing what I would have to do. Arona's bombs were part of an old-style military arsenal, located in a remote mountainside bunker. That was Ripley's target. The alien queen mother would gather her flock for nuclear Armageddon. Those not killed by the initial blast would be left without any function. There's no reason for you to come, Newt. You'll be safe here. Newt did not protest. I know. I didn't have much time. Something had changed Ripley during our time apart. And yet, in a real way, she was the only one who would truly understand what I was about to do. Hicks watched the mountains grow as the Kurtz got closer to its destination. They had all regrouped around the control area and waited now while Brewster efficiently maneuvered the ship through the forested landscape. Thankfully, the monitor revealed less destruction out here. The mother alien still beat at the walls downstairs, but there was no sign of her children through the blanket of trees. Yet. There were several small peaks, all part of a range that ran through the northwest. According to Tully's read, a few of them were volcanic, although none were currently active. That'd be a kick, she thought. We land and get buried in lava. They would drop the queen in a small enclosed valley near the base of Verona's mountain and then fly to the arsenal a few minutes farther west. Since most of the creatures would come from inland, this would save the Kurtz from being trampled by them on their way to the queen, or so Hicks hoped. The Kurtz moved slowly over the treetops toward a towering mountain. We got a hole, said Tully quickly. A big one. She listed the coordinates to Brewster. Hicks grinned at Ripley. The Queen might not take off running if they could find a cave to dump her into. There was no way to be sure, but Hicks had never seen one of the creatures trapeze around in the open if there was somewhere dark to hide. They could only hope that the Mother was similar to the other Queens in that regard. When Ripley mentioned the idea, he had once again been very glad that she was back in charge. Great, said McQuaid. That thing is starting to get on my nerves. Amen, said Falk. The ship moved at a crawl. Hicks spotted the cavern, a dark opening in the rocks at ground level. Perfect. He was ready. As soon as they dumped the alien, they would hurry to the bunker and get to work. Unless the setup was completely destroyed, they could fix it fast and get the fuck off the planet. It was probably just a rewire job. Ready, kids? said Brewster. The Kurtz was in place. Do it, said Ripley. They all watched Brewster push the button to open the outer hatch. A faint hum from the console, and a small red light flashed. Shit, said Ripley. The hatch hadn't opened. The queen continued to scream. What the fuck is wrong, said Hicks. I don't... Mechanical failure somewhere, said Brewster. He touched the button again. The light blinked. Hicks looked over at Ripley. She chewed at her lip for a second and slapped her hand against the console. She's pressing against the goddamn door, said Ripley. 
Stupid bitch is probably punching the pretty button, blocking her own goddamn exit. She turned to the stairwell. Open shipwide calm and try it again when I say so, Brewster. Hicks, come with me. He followed Ripley down the stairs. The roar of the engines was incredibly loud as they hurried through the APC bay together. The door from here is sealed, he shouted to her. Ripley ignored him and jogged over to a tool cabinet set into the wall. She tossed a spanner to him and grabbed a second wrench, stepped to the wall and hit it. Hicks joined her, began to beat at the alloy with the spanner. Hey, asshole, over here, Ripley shouted. Come on, come on. Hicks hit the wall high, again and again. Between the engines, the queen, and the echoing crash of metal on metal, he was surprised that he heard the new sounds. Through the wall came an awful scraping noise, nails on clear steel, or rather talons on alloy. Ripley hit the door once more and then shouted to the comm behind her. Go! A few seconds passed, and the ship suddenly lifted slightly as the queen's cries faded into nothing. Hicks turned to face Ripley. She was still looking at the containment chamber. Not that smart, is she? She said. She spoke loudly to be heard over the engines. The ship sped to the far side of the mountain in the early afternoon. Let's bring her in, said Ripley. Keep an eye on the readings. It may not be as easy as it looks. Dust swirled up around the ship as it settled to the ground with a rumble. After a moment, the air cleared. Tully? said Ripley. Nada. If anyone's here, they're not moving. That door didn't explode by itself, said Brewster. We should secure the area. Me? Take chances? said Ripley. Come on, folks. Let's get armed. We start at the first building and work around, said Hicks. Marines up front. Falk, you're on point. Once the area is secured, we'll come back for tools and then get to work on the detonator problem. Ripley put her hand on the door controls and looked at them. Any questions? No one spoke. They descended at the base of the hill in front of the gate. The metal door looked as if it had been melted open with a welding device. It sported a huge gaping hole in the middle. Ripley had thought weapons fire when she had seen it from the Kurtz, but the edges of the holes were smooth. She wondered exactly what had gone on in the last hours here, before the scientists had been taken. Looks like the military bomb specialists were in quite a hurry to get in, Ripley observed. Your Dr. Arona had them wire the nukes into the detonation pattern just prior to evacuation. Tully caught up to Ripley as she approached the entrance. God only knows why they didn't blow the first time. God only knows, echoed Ripley. Hicks stepped into the darkness first. Ripley waited a few beats and then followed, pulled herself through the hole and took a breath. The air was thick with moisture and the smell of mold. Grayish-green moss and lichens had developed in scraggly patches along the inside of the gate. Nice place. The small room she had stepped into led to a dark corridor, a mechanical door, stuck halfway open, separating the two. Got a straight walk ahead of you for ten meters, then a T. The sign says Armory on the right and Control left. No sign of infestation and the mold is pretty thick on either branch. I think we're alone. Ripley let out her air and stepped around the broken door. You heard him, she said. Falk and Tully came in behind her with the equipment cases. Ripley kept her weapon trained toward the armory, although Hicks was right, it didn't look like anyone had been here in months. Anyone or anything, she added mentally. Maybe the firing sequence was interrupted by some natural phenomenon, said Hicks. These weapons were never meant to withstand exposure to the elements. There's enough firepower here to level the continent, but the bombs themselves are fragile as dust. Falk jogged ahead. Not a real complicated maze. Hall runs straight twenty meters and then elbows into control. Let me check the other side and we're set. He called his companions down. I think I figured out why the bombs were never detonated. And it's more than corrosion. Somebody decided to put a stop to this countdown permanently. What the hell did this? Doesn't look like any conventional burn. Tully shook her head. I don't like this. I don't like it one bit. You don't have to like it, Tully, said Ripley. Just fix it. Radio the dropship. This project's a go. 
McQuaid sat in the control room of the Kurtz and listened to Ripley's report. We've localized the problem, but it's going to take longer than I'd hoped. Everything has been dislinked. No sign of infestation, but stand by, just in case. Her voice was punctuated with heavy static. The comms weren't designed to send or receive through so many tons of rock. How long? said McQuaid. We'll be lucky to get out of here by dark. Your signal's breaking up. Energy fields playing hell with the communications. Continue ten-minute updates and continuous motion sweeps. You pick up movement, get the hell out of there. Farrell raised his head in alarm. What the? Sir, did you authorize a lower deck launch sequence? What? McQuaid exclaimed. Someone's broken into one of the loader bays. Jesus. They're launching one of the cargo ships. The captain's face turned red. Get me an open line into that vessel. This is Captain McQuaid. Identify yourself. Newt answered on the line. I... I'm sorry, Captain. But this is the only way. Amy's not dead. I can feel it. Newt toggled the user-friendly controls and the flyer began to lift. She understood most of the buttons and hoped that what she didn't know wouldn't hurt her. She yanked the headset off and threw it down as the captain shouted at her and the small ship pivoted in the air. She knew they were pissed, but they didn't need her to finish. Ripley's hatred was behind everything the older woman did. Newt was motivated by a feeling that seemed just as strong. Love? She strapped in with a silent prayer as the flyer rocketed south. Please let this work. I'd learned a lot watching Hicks. I triangulated a course using the coordinates from Amy's last video transmission and borrowed the ship's go codes from the Gateway security computer. The cargo ships were designed to be piloted by mainline field soldiers. Most of the onboard systems were strictly automatic. She was just a little girl, lost in the ruin of man's greed and madness. We'd never even met, but I knew her. Her name was Amy. Her name was Newt. We would survive this together, or not at all. I wasn't sure where to begin, and then I heard the screams. Just like before. Like Acheron. Like all the rest. The sound was so close, the reverberating beneath the broken streets. Each time I escaped the alien, it seemed to bring me back. I began to realize this was more than capricious fate or chance. It was design. It was meant to be. The terrible screams grew louder, and I wanted to join them, add my voice to the rising howl of pain and horror. Jesus, God, I didn't want to die. She started down the corridor to her left. Her footsteps echoed loudly and hollowly in the cool, dead air. If anyone was in the building, she wasn't going to be a surprise to them. Within seconds, the lights from the outside had disappeared completely. The hallway seemed to go on forever. She struggled to damp down a feeling of dread that threatened to rise up and bloom into panic. The stale air was clammy against her skin. She didn't know where she was headed. Anything could be waiting for her. Watching her. And it was dark. That was the worst. It was blacker than space. She stopped. This was completely stupid. She would go back outside and reevaluate the situation. She was going to lose it in here. Suddenly, she heard a noise directly behind her. She froze. Just a little sound. Could be anything. A shift of weight or... Newt screamed and jerked the trigger. The blackness broke and reformed around the burst of gunfire. The sound deafening in the corridor as the bullets hit the wall. I could feel my skin blister from the heat of the blaster fire. There were hundreds of them. Thousands. All adjuncts of their queen, desperate to protect her protect her unborn children. As long as I was alive, I was a threat to their survival. Somehow, intuitively, the alien intelligence knew that. I wanted Amy. They wanted me. Newt fell to the floor and scrabbled backward on her elbows after catching a glimpse of tattered clothing. 
She pointed the carbine ahead of her and tried to think clearly, until a pair of rough hands brushed against her face. Oh God, don't shoot, stop, a man's voice. Please, I'm sane, I'm sane, he sounded as terrified as she felt. She held her fire as the man babbled on. Please, I have to find her, don't kill me. It's you, she said. Your transmissions. Amy, is she? His eyes widened. My God, you were watching. You saw. Follow me. We may still make it out of here alive. There are underground tunnels throughout the complex, he said. They have Amy with the others, part of their food or breeding stock. There's a nest at the east end. He spoke quickly, tried to say everything at once. I've been trying to get in, but I can't. There were drone guards, and today they started running away, north, and I heard ships. I heard your ship. Do you have any idea what it's been like? Hearing her cry out, knowing there was nothing I could do? Yes, I do. That's why I'm here, said Newt. If Amy was still alive, maybe she'd be in the nest, waiting to be implanted. Maybe most of the guards would be on their way to the Queen. True, there'd probably be a few left behind to guard the eggs that were still unhatched, but maybe it wasn't over yet. They... they've taken Amy with them, taken her to a new place. The fanatics call it the Holy Land. There, he pointed to Arona's mountain, the Holy Land. Newt gasped. Ripley. Oh my god. Falk pulled the control board from the wall and worked over the dismantled pieces and stripped wires for hours. It had to go sequentially, A to B to C and so on, or the hidden bombs, some of them kilometers away, wouldn't all detonate. Rewire the wrong way and the first explosion could knock the system apart. That wouldn't do at all. That's it, he said over the comm. Three hours and counting. The howls of the closing army were nearer, more distinct now. He knew it took thousands of bugs to make that kind of noise. Hicks scanned the skies as the minutes stretched by, compound bathed in reddish twilight. Thinking about it, Hicks realized they had made a mistake. They should have wired the bombs first, parked the ship with the queen somewhere else to draw the brood, then dropped her off after things were ready. They hadn't thought it out right, hadn't expected the damn things to come so fast, for there to be so many of them from that direction. Hicks took a deep breath and let it out slowly. He knew Ripley would wait until the last possible second to pull out, but that second seemed much closer suddenly, and it was almost dark. Hicks, company, due west, now, McQuaid shouted. Hicks pointed his rifle at the trees and yelled through the gate. Ripley, Falk, let's move. As a unit, they moved toward the ship. The woods crashed and crunched with the sounds of movement, but there was still nothing to see. The first drone broke from the trees and ran into the compound, its long body hunched, arms extended. It was going to see the queen, but they were between it and her. All three of them fired at once, the thing shrieked and hit the ground, nearly cut in two by the armor-piercing bullets. The forest suddenly erupted, spewed forth a handful of drones at once. They loped for the threesome, howled as the rain of bullets found them. Go, Ripley said. She stood her ground, continued to fire as more of the drones ran into view. Hicks spun in the open hatch and fired. Dozens of the bugs came out of the trees, their insane bodies moving at great speed. Ripley, he yelled. She backed to the curtains without looking and nearly tripped on the deck. Hicks took out three more of the creatures as he turned and stumbled inside. Fogg hit the button. The hatch slid up and in, too slow. But they were all inside. A score of aliens pounded at the closed hatch, their cries muffled through the alloy. McQuaid, Brewster, get us out of here, Ripley yelled into her set. Farrell detected something on his radar, en route to the site. He notified Brewster. I'm picking up another ship on the inboard radar. Automatic scan says it's cargo class, registered to Gateway. That's impossible, scoffed Brewster. Double check the system, then get Ripley up here, pronto. Speeding toward the destination, Newt and her guide aboard the cargo flyer realized their dire situation. Newt felt panic take over her. We're getting close, the old man said. 
God, those things are everywhere. He looked to Newt. What's wrong? It's one thing to preset coordinates, but I've never flown one of these at close range. She took a deep breath. I'm scared. Alarms began blaring. Shit, we're losing power. I don't know how to stop it. We're going in. At Brewster's orders, Farrell had brought Ripley up to the cockpit to advise her of their findings. What do you mean another ship? Gateway hasn't clocked any ground-based Earth traffic for weeks. Farrell motioned to the screen. It's from Gateway, and it's about to crash. The flyer skidded over the surface of the site with an ear-piercing screech. Despair washed over Newt at the sight of the empty compound. Well, almost empty. Even in the heavy dusk, she could see the dark, alien bodies strewn on the ground. Oh no, she said softly. Her companion was knocked out cold. She pulled at him, speaking apologetically, as much as to him as to herself. We have to... we have to get away from the ship. They'd had to leave. There'd been no choice, she told herself, over and over. In spite of what she knew to be the truth, a knot formed in her throat. She had been abandoned. Ripley had finished the detonator, and the Kurtz had left. They would die. But she had made her decision, and no alternative but to accept the results. I'm sorry, she said. Christ. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Her heart pounded as the hatch swung open. You should be, said Ripley. In her panic, Newt had not registered the sounds of the Kurtz's engines returning to the site, to Ripley, with a less than warm reception. What the hell did you think you were doing by coming here? You know what we're risking just by landing? The mountain's alive with those alien things, and the bombs have been armed. Amy's father... is he? Your passenger's unconscious, but he'll survive. Is that what this was about? Damn it, Newt. The little girl's dead. No. They've taken her with them. Maybe you can leave without her, but I can't. No, said Ripley. We have to get out of here, now. If the things come back and start poking around the compound, they could mess up the bombs. I'm sorry. Jesus, what a shitty deal, she thought. She was sorry, but the truth was someone had to keep the priorities straight. The Kurtz's engines were cycling. Ripley stood in the APC bay with Newt and the old man had listened to their story with mixed emotions. The initial happiness that Newt had returned had been replaced by frustration and disbelief, and a horrible, dreadful sense of nostalgia, one shared fully by Newt. She had risked everything to pull me from the wreckage of the cargo ship, but I still couldn't forgive Ripley for leaving me alone on Acheron. And even worse, she hadn't forgiven herself. Tully and Falk fired at the incoming drones. T minus one hour and counting. Surrounded by these goddamn things. I think someone's trying to tell us something. Newt's injured friends cinched up and ready to fly, said Hicks. We'll chit-chat later. Right now, let's get airborne. You don't have to wait for us, said Newt. She wiped at her tear-stained face roughly, like a child, but stood tall. Just help us get to her coordinates. You can do that with the computer in a minute. And then what? said Ripley. You're going to sit down in the middle of 10,000 drones on the chance that she's alive? I understand why. I know how it feels, but that's suicide. Ripley knew that she was right, but suddenly didn't want to meet Newt's gaze. Did she remember how it felt? Fucking hypocrite. What had happened to her? All she wanted now was to destroy the breed that had destroyed her life by taking her daughter. Ripley didn't speak. Her thoughts jumbled. Her goal was to kill the creatures. Once upon a time, there'd been other goals, back when she still cared. She looked up at Newt and saw a very familiar face. Not yet, she told Hicks. Tell Brewster to fire up the APC. Newt and I are going back in. He watched as Ripley gathered extra magazines and two portable lamps from supply and felt the anger build. Finally, he couldn't stand it. You're out of your fucking minds. He searched for words, frustrated. Think about it. The mountain's crawling with those things. We've got less than an hour until detonation. Ripley spoke over her shoulder as if she hadn't heard him. I'm not leaving her, Hicks. Not this time. And never again. Stay with the dropship. Give us as much time as you can. But 
when the shit comes down, I want you to leave and let it go. She turned, faced him, expression set. He wanted to scream. When McQuaid had spotted Newt's flyer, something inside him had released. That was the only word he could put to it. And now, Newt and Ripley were about to go try and kill themselves. No. Stop this. I'll come with you, he said. At least let me do that. No, Ripley said calmly. She shouldered her rifle. Someone's got to make sure this thing gets finished. She's not your kid, he tried. Newt and Ripley looked at each other, and then at Hicks. Yeah, she is, Newt said. She's ours. Ripley said, besides, we don't have any room. That's bullshit. There's... Cut it, Hicks. We're going. You're not. Damn it, Ripley, this is suicide. Are you doing this for that little girl, or for yourself? Does it matter? Take care of yourself, Hicks. He followed them down the steps and into the APC bay and tried to think of something else to say. Ready? said Newt. Ripley nodded. Hicks looked at Newt. He wasn't sure how he felt. Didn't know what could happen between them in the right circumstances, but... She looked back at him, obviously prepared for some kind of plea. Defiant. Strong. Please, come back, he said to her. You have to come back, kid. Because... I know, Duane. Christ, he felt as if he were going to cry. He turned to Ripley. Be careful, he said. She nodded at him. The door opened, and they were gone. They drove to the east without speaking. Newt was scared, but determined, and she could see that Ripley felt the same way. There was nothing to say. As they got closer to the Queen's Mountain, the noise increased, making the situation pretty damn clear. Ripley had spent years trying to forget all she had left behind, more than family and career. She'd lost her self-respect, her dignity. I knew what Hicks was thinking, but he was wrong. This wasn't suicide. Ripley and I didn't want to die. We were trying to find a way to live. Maybe the little girl could show us. As they approached the Holy Land, maybe 100,000 of the Queen's children screeched, a roiling sea of deadly, mindless monsters. She wondered what was on the agenda for their convention, if they had any idea what they were doing here, or what was going to happen to them. And she wondered how many more there were to come. The pounding started almost immediately. Through the shield, dark figures continued to stream past, their cries doppling away. Hold on, Newt, said Ripley. We're going in. Newt nodded, her cheeks flushed. A wall of creatures ran into the tank and fell, sprayed acid and bits of exoskeleton behind them. Son of a bitch, we're starting to lose system control. The goddamn acid must be eating through the hydraulics. What's that mean? shouted Newt. It means I'm losing her. I'm loose. The APC skidded, overturned. For a moment, there was only darkness. And then, there was light. Ripley blew the explosive bolts on the side hatch and climbed out to face her demons. I followed close behind, ready to face my own. Find her, Newt. Just find her. Ripley jumped with her and fired repeatedly into the oncoming tide of drones. An alien skittered across the top of the APC and prepared to lunge. Newt smashed in its chest with a short burst. They sidestepped into the tunnels, weapons on full auto. They scanned the area for more. Newt took in the human blood that painted the interior, the articles of shredded clothing that lay about, and the bodies. Amy! She screamed. Talk to me, Amy. God, please! A weak call from within the tunnels. Help me. A red-haired girl cried out, the sound lost as the weapons thundered. The girl huddled against the wall and sobbed. Newt crooned at the girl. It's okay, Amy. It's okay. It's okay. Hang on, honey. Just hang on. Her throat felt as dry as sand. I knew you were alright. I knew it. At the sound of Newt's voice, she lifted her puffy face and looked at her. 
Hold me. Please don't let them take me again. Please. Your daddy sent us, said Newt. He's safe. Really? Amy's eyes widened. Yes, said Newt. Really? Amy's face changed. The look of despair swept away. Tears still running, the child stood and stumbled across the room toward Newt, who stretched out her arms. Amy fell into them and hugged her hard. There was a splintering crash from behind, and a hiss. The Mother Queen. She emerged, roaring wildly, the cries of her children inside and out in concert with her deafening cries. The mother screeched, grabbing for the child as Newt tried to run off with her. She was exhausted. The mere weight of the little girl was almost too much. Then, a call from across the way. The voice of an old friend. Hey bitch, it's me you want. She quietly sidestepped to Newt and Amy, not leaving her eyes off of the queen. Newt, she whispered. Move over here with me. Her attention turned to the mother monster, loud, clear, and aware of what they've walked into. That's why you had your babies keep the little girl alive. You knew we'd come for her. Aiming the carbine at the queen, she shouted back to Newt. Get back to the APC and wait for me. I've got something to finish. She stared into the blank dome where she thought eyes may be, looking through with an intensity and focus she'd never felt before. As if words were not necessary, as if their minds were connected and there were no need for words. Fifteen minutes, and this whole mountain's going to be so much dust. But that's not the point, is it? This is what's important. You and me. I thought I'd let the bombs finish you, but it's better this way. Come on, take a good look. It's the last thing you'll ever see. Ripley raised her weapons and fired into the nightmare creature. The spray of bullets batted it down. Amazed, Ripley discovered she didn't want to die. The monster flew back, sprayed pieces of burning shell. Ripley avoided the spray of acid blood as it hurtled to the ground, against the walls pouring down the Mother Queen's body. Gunfire pierced through her skull, her chest, and limbs. For all of the mental hold she had had over her brood, and the grasp she had over humanity, she died quite swiftly. Her children were now orphans, and they were filled with rage. The Kurtz was in the air, flying an eight pattern high over the compound. Hicks hadn't waited for the bugs to show. Half an hour into Ripley's time limit, he'd had Brewster take the ship up. If they were coming back, better that they had a clear spot to land. Damn it, Ripley, where the hell are you? Twelve minutes and counting, said Brewster. We're eating up our safety margin, but quick. The last time I played it safe, I ended up with a pistol against my head. But this time, there's no room for dispute. If we're not out of here in five minutes, kiss your ass goodbye. Newt hustled Amy out of the tunnel in front of her. She searched the darkness wildly for targets. Move, shouted Ripley. She caught up to the pair, firing occasional bursts of ammo at the creatures that still ran at them. Twelve minutes to detonation, said Newt, panting. We've got to get outside. Christ, Ripley, the APC's totaled. I don't think they're going to let us walk out. Who said anything about walking? Ripley replied. Get inside the APC. Now. It will take those things a couple of minutes to squeeze inside. That should be enough time. What the hell are we doing, Ripley? Newt said, climbing inside the overturned vehicle with her companions. Ripley was confident in her last-ditch effort for escape. Inside the vehicle, a pod. Just room for two adults and a small child. They designed this escape pod for quick exits in case of internal core damage. It's supposed to blow up and out, but we're going to change the specifications. Hold tight. The pod blasted through the tunnels, past the hordes of pursuing xenomorphs with blinding speed. A narrow trajectory, a very lucky shot, but perhaps too late. Brewster was resigned. Right. That's it. He couldn't look at Hicks. We're out of here. I'm sorry, man, but... Hicks's face lit up. Wait a minute. What the hell is that? My god. It looks like some sort of projectile. Or 
escape pod. Take her down. Now. I remember the rest of it in isolated fragments. Hicks said the pod's internal chute slowed us down, softening our impact. All I knew, all I cared, was that Amy was safe. The next thing I remember is lying in the dropship's sickbay and Ripley standing over me. She wanted to hold me, tell me everything would be alright. But she was afraid. Only half conscious, I was a little girl again, and I trusted her. Are... are we going to sleep all the way home? God, yes. All the way home. And I'll never leave you. I drifted to sleep in Ripley's arms, knowing she'd still be there when I awoke. Knowing it was finally over. It was while I was recovering on Gateway that I decided to write this diary, my record of what had happened. I hope it will serve as both a remembrance and a warning. Ripley, Hicks, Tully, Falk, they were alive. They had faced the alien and survived. It was more than that, they had conquered. I would never tell them the truth. What it told me, viscerally, as we landed on the Alien Queen's world. What, in some strange way, I must have known all along. We'd been used. It destroyed the detonator connecting Arona's bombs. It had called Ripley back to Earth. It had sent us in search of the Mother Queen. It used us to eradicate the alien scourge so it could terraform then take Earth for itself. For an instant, I felt a wave of anger. Everything we'd been through. Was it all a sham? A dance for the others' pleasure? Then I remembered something Ripley had said. This wasn't about Earth anymore. It was for us. We'd come to terms with our fear and our pain. There would be other worlds for us. New lives, free of the alien. Human greed and rage had brought the alien to Earth. We had failed. It was time to move on. Perhaps Earth's new inhabitants would learn from our mistakes. Perhaps not. In this series, I've been recounting the Earth War, as depicted in the Aliens comic series. The accounts are explored as originally published, despite certain names, locations, and other events having been altered over time. Aliens Books 1, 2, and 3 were written by Mark Verheiden, with art by Mark A. Nelson, Dennis Bovet, Sam Keith, and additional coloring by Monica Livingston. The novelizations were written by Stephen and Stephanie Perry. The original comic series and its revised editions were produced by Dark Horse Comics. As always, I'd like to thank you very much for watching. I really appreciate it. And if you enjoy this video, please make sure to give it a like. And you can also subscribe to keep up to date with all the latest videos from the channel and for what lies beyond the Earth War. My very special thanks to the Patreon Hive, Queen Albert Newell, Wayland yutani Executives, Emurik, and Mark Fox, and in the Ellen Ripley tier of excellence, Lady Anne. If you'd like to join the Hive and support the channel, check out my Patreon page for exclusive posts and contests. In the meantime, you can catch up with Alien Theory over social media. Follow at Alien underscore Theory on Twitter and at Alien Theory YT on Facebook and Instagram for more. And until next time, this is Alien Theory, signing off. <laughs>